All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm Rachel Platt. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at the Fraser History Museum. As we commemorate Native American Heritage Month, we are so pleased to see a big crowd here tonight in the house to learn more. To learn more about American Indian history in Kentucky, how far back it dates, who lived here, how they lived, what happened to them, and what about current day? Our experts tonight will help answer those questions and tell a much fuller story than perhaps we've learned in the past. We're gonna introduce them in just a moment. And I've already warned you all right in the front here, I just kind of wanted to ask a question. This is to formulate from my own knowledge of what brought you out here tonight. I'm always you know, curious about what it is. Can anybody just raise their hand or shout out why they wanted to come tonight? To learn more, is it something that, go ahead ma'am, I'm sorry. Acknowledgement, acknowledgement. Do you all feel just a show of hands? Do you feel like you've learned everything you need to on this subject? Anybody with a yes to raise your hand? No? No, <laughs> all the hands go up. All right, so would it be fair to say we don't feel like we know enough or have learned enough and that's what brought many of us out tonight? Good to know, that helps inform decisions on future programming, thank you. Whatever the reason, though, that brought you here tonight, we thank you for coming. Kentucky's Native History is part of our Bridging the Divide series, and it is sponsored by the Gaines Foundation. We thank them. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. The picture you see behind me, isn't that beautiful? We love this picture. It's a portrait that was done by the artist Brett Hartsfield. Is his mama here tonight? She mentioned she might try and come. Okay, I just wanted to make sure to acknowledge her. So that was just to let you know, part of this book, Bluegrass Bold, Stories of Kentucky Women, by authors Carly Mutertees and Maddie Shepard. She right here is representative of Kentucky's Native Women. Her picture is also in our Commonwealth exhibit because that exhibit begins with the Native American story in Kentucky. One of the consultants who helped us tell that fuller story in the exhibit is sitting in the front row right here, LaDonna Brown, the Director of Research and Cultural Interpretation, the Chickasaw Nation. We welcome her all the way from Oklahoma tonight as one of our experts. Another presenter tonight is A. Gwen Henderson. She is the Education Director for the Kentucky Archaeological Survey, a program of the Department of Folk Studies and Anthropology at Western Kentucky University. Both LaDonna and Gwen have been working with Kentucky teachers this afternoon, discussing and sharing this important history. If you all don't mind, how many teachers are in the house tonight? A whole lot. Thank you all for coming. I know, round of applause. <laughs> On their own time learning more, and we have to say we love that. We appreciate your coming because history is so important. As Gwen said in an email to me, native history is Kentucky history. LaDonna then added, our history is world history because the world first came to us. I said, I'm using both of those. I'm swiping them. Thank you all very much for that. We also want to welcome in the front row here, Ann Bader, the principal investigator with Corn Island Archaeology based in Jefferson Town. And finally, we have Fred Nez Keems, a Navajo flute player, who will tell us a little bit more about his story later in the program but at the beginning is going to be playing some traditional native music during the creation story that LaDonna is going to tell us, and then he'll join us again later in the program with his own personal story. Before we get to these presentations, and yes, it's a very full night, we are also honored to have opening remarks from Mike Berry, the Secretary of the Kentucky Tourism, Arts, and Heritage Cabinet. Telling a fuller story and a more diverse story about Kentucky is certainly part of his mission, but I'm going to let Secretary Barry tell you that in his own words. So please help me welcome Secretary Mike Barry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. It's an honor to be here and uh, to represent the Commonwealth as we celebrate this new and important program, Kentucky's Native History. And I've got to do a little commercial first for this building where we are. Where's Andy Trannon over here? 
Um, the Fraser Museum is one of my favorite places to come visit. I'm a Louisville native, uh, and uh, I, I had some folks, about 30, that were coming in from all over the United States, nobody from Kentucky, and I had to host them somewhere. And um, they made it possible for me to bring it into this beautiful facility. Uh, they took the tour. We had lunch in the speakeasy. Uh, we even did a bourbon tasting. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, they were bowled over by it. Uh, we also saw the Kentucky show. If you haven't gotten to see that, make sure you do. Uh, but Andy, thank you for making that possible for those folks. Uh, the bourbon tasting came after Andy's tour, so I know they really did enjoy it without the <laughs> bourbon assistance. Uh, the Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet uh, is a proud supporting sponsor of the Fraser Museum and the Commonwealth Divided We Fall exhibit. The Cabinet understands the importance of telling Kentucky's story and remembering our state's diverse history. We simply can't tell our story without recognizing, without recognizing and understanding the contributions and impact that Native Americans have made to Kentucky's rich, cultural heritage. For Native American Heritage Month, our cabinet, through our agency, the Kentucky Heritage Council, is highlighting resources, sharing pertinent information, and hosting events, including collaborating in our 45 Kentucky State Parks to host free events showcasing Native American history and culture. Research at archeological sites in every county, there's 120 of them in this Commonwealth, has recovered evidence of a native presence. By examining the archeological record, we know that for over 12,000 years, Kentucky was the permanent home for many native groups and is still home to thousands of Native Americans today. One of those Native American archeological sites recognized by the National Register of Historic Places is our state park, Wycliffe Mounds Historic Site. Now Wycliffe Mounds, if you're traveling to the western part of the state, and I'll use the term far western part of the state, I highly recommend that you visit Wycliffe where you can see the mounds that were built by Native people, learn about the archeological site of the Native American village that once occupied that land, and view exhibits of pottery, stone, tools, and artifacts. Now, I happen to be going down there again on Monday of this coming week, and uh, just to let you know, everybody thinks Paducah is the dropping off point. It's not. You, to, to get to Wycliffe and Wycliffe Mounds, to get to Columbus Belmont Park, et cetera, you keep driving west and you come into some of the most beautiful territory that you can ever see and you're only stopped by the Mississippi River. But down there, just because you get to the Mississippi doesn't mean you're finished with Kentucky because you cross into Missouri and then a little while longer you cross back into Kentucky. It's a long story, you'll have to look at the map. The cabinet continues to educate the public through the Kentucky Heritage Council's Native American Heritage Commission, which works to promote the role and importance of Native Americans to the history and development of the Commonwealth. The commission offers resources and educational, and educational initiatives for educators, and thanks to all of those wonderful teachers who are here tonight. It develops programs and events for and about Native Americans in Kentucky, and so much more. And I also want to thank A. Gwen Henderson for the role you play on the commission, and we appreciate your contributions and your expertise. The cabinet also highlighted Kentucky Native American culture through the arts when one of our other agencies, and there's 13 agencies under our cabinets, this one, the Kentucky Arts Council, partnered with the Native American Heritage Commission to launch Native Reflections. It was a traveling art exhibit and it journeyed across the Commonwealth from 2020 to early 2022, featuring 23 works by 12 different artists. One of the artists is, uh, is here this evening, Fred Nez Keems, uh, who you will meet and enjoy his performance. Uh, he's also lending his talents this year to another program, and if you were standing there a while ago, I didn't realize it was a secret, blurted it out, and uh, so now, you know, you'll, you'll have to kill me to get it out of me. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. The Cabinet appreciates all that you do for our agencies. 
The Fraser Museum, as I said, is a world-class attraction that draws visitors from every city, state, and nation. Uh, Andy was telling me they had visitors from all 50 states here last year. And this facility will continue to help elevate and educate, along with tonight's program, and the Commonwealth exhibit. So on behalf of Team Kentucky and Governor Andy Bashir, I want to thank you for hosting this program of learning and highlighting the importance of telling Kentucky's story. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Berry. We really appreciate it. All right, tonight's program starts at the beginning, as we said, with the creation and migration story. And for that, we're going to bring LaDonna Brown with the Chickasaw Nation to the podium, and Fred Nez Keems will accompany the story. Let's bring you both up. Thank you. Can y'all see me? Chugma, Soho Chifoet, LaDonna Brown, Chikasha Iyagni Toksalili, Chikasha Saya Micha Shawi Iksa Saya. Hello, my name is LaDonna Brown. I work for the Chickasaw Nation. I am Chickasaw, and I am from the Raccoon Clan, and I'm wearing my, my totem here. Um, I serve as the Director of Research and Cultural Inter Interpretation in the Heritage Preservation at the Chickasaw Nation. And today I will be presenting information regarding Chickasaw history and how we are connected to the area which is known as Southwestern Kentucky, where the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers are located. So first, what I want to start off with is our uh, migration, our what story is this? <laughs> um, I want to start off with our creation story. Um, and if you go up to the exhibit, um, you will notice that the creation story is shown in the exhibit, but not necessarily told. So tonight you will hear the name, the story. But just to let you know, our history began thousands of years ago, and it's reinforced by stories re related to this ancient history. And two significant stories are told. One is the migration story, and one is the creation story. This particular picture was painted by one of our artists known as James Blackburn. And so here is the account of the creation story. So here is our cre official creation story. The Chickasaw believed in a supreme being, a composite force consisting of the four beloved things above, the sun, the clouds, and he who dwells above the heavens, whom we call Ababanili. Ababanili made all men from the dust of Mother Earth. The crawfish brought up mud from the bottom of the waters to form the earth. The crawfish piled the wet soil into a mound and it was a mass of, uh, of er, or mud that we refer to as the Mother Earth. But he didn't like the way that it was flat. And so Raven, and you'll see Raven over there. Raven, he asked Raven to come help. And he asked Raven to, to fly around this ball of mud so that it would dry this ball of mud. And when the raven flew around this ball of mud and it began to dry, where the raven's wings dipped down, it created the valleys. And when the raven's wings came up, it created the mountains. And that is how our Mother Earth was created. The part of the Ababanili closest to the Chickasaw was the sun. It's when we look at the sun, we think of it as the great holy fire above. When we have a sacred fire on this earth, we believe that it is the representation of God on earth. The sacred fire is represented um, in each family's home. And that means that we have God in our homes when we have a part of that sacred fire um, in our homes. Um, 
Our next story is a migration story. It explains how we arrived into the Southeast. Um, a long time ago, there came a time when the Chickasaw people needed to move from their home that was in the West. After praying to our creator, Abominili, it was revealed to our Hopai, or our prophets, in a vision that two brothers, Chiksa and Chanta, were to lead our ancestors on a journey to the east. Within the vision of the Hopai, Ababanili revealed that the brothers would gain direction from an Itifabasa Holitopa, which was a sacred pole. This pole was to be planted in the middle of the camp and every night and in the mornings when they woke up, whichever direction it was leaning in, that would be the direction that they would uh, travel for the day. When the pole stood straight up, our ancestors would know that that was the that would be their that was their home. A Babanili, our creator, also sent an animal guide. Our animal guide is known as Ofi Tobi Ishto. Ofi Tobi Ishto uh, translates to large white dog. He, he was sent to assist and protect our ancestors. And he would travel ahead, scouting for any dangerous animals or people meaning harm, any potential threats, and he healed the physical wounds of the, of the injured. Eventually, our people came to a large body of flowing water. It was the largest body of flowing water that our ancestors had ever seen. Today, we know this um, large body of water to be the Mississippi River. When the people put the pole in the ground that evening, the next morning they woke up and the, and the pole was still leaning to the east, so they realized that they should create rafts for everyone. Everyone would jump on a raft, float across the river, and once again begin their journey to the new homeland. Um, so the people hurriedly set about constructing the rafts. Soon the crossing of all the people was underway. Um, during this time, our large white dog, Ofitobiyushto, was on one of the rafts. When the raft got to the middle of the river, it broke apart. The people who was on the raft, they barely traveled, they barely swam to the, to the other river bank. But Ofitobiyushto floated down the river. And we never saw Ofitobiyushto again after that. Um, but He's very important to our story. He's very important to our people, and he would forever become a part of our journey. When the people reached the other side of the river, um, once again, they put the pole in the ground that evening, and the next morning when they woke up, they saw a very strange sight. What they saw was this pole was wobbling around. It was not standing still and so the one of the brothers who was the leader said this pole is standing straight up this is where we need to stay the other brother said this pole is still leaning to the east we will travel to the east till we find our homeland um the brother who thought the pole was standing straight up was uh was chata and chata said um, we're gonna, this, this pole is standing straight up. Chiksa said the pole is still leaning to the east. We should still travel to the east. So they talked about it all day long. And you know what happens when you talk about something all day long? Eventually, you know, tempers are gonna flare. People are gonna get a little, you know, animated with each other. Um, so Chata said this. Uh, this pole, anybody who believes that this pole is standing straight up, we, you will stay with me. We will call this our new homeland. Chiksa said, anybody who believes this pole is still leaning to the east, we will travel to the east until we find our true homeland. When the, this division happened, we can think of this as the beginning of the Choctaw and the Chickasaw people. So these stories are very old. They have been handed down in our families for thousands of years. Our ancestors did not attach a date to them. 
the events from these two stories transpired at a very early time, which creates a starting point on a timeline for the history that occurred in this portion of the continent. And at that point, we will go to Gwen, who will tell us about the things that were found. Well, Donna, that was marvelous. Wasn't that marvelous? Oh my gosh. Okay, do I just forward it? Down, Down it? There, oh, there we go, okay. LaDonna's story is her people's story. Words and history shared, passed down orally and in ceremonies and in writing and in images. The story Anne and I will share draws on anthropological research about human cultures worldwide and on archaeological research of places and objects and patterns right here in Kentucky. A story is written in the land. My presentation tonight covers over 10,000 years of Native history <clears throat> in uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> I'll try. Honestly, I'll try. Stories told through songs and ceremonies, through places, through everyday objects. I can only hit the highlights, of course. Lifeways and foodways, technologies and trade. LaDonna will pick it up again in the early 1800s and the time of forced Indian removal. Anne will talk about specific objects from this area. If you remember nothing from my short, brief, and swift review, please remember this. Native peoples have always lived in Kentucky, facing environmental and social challenges across the millennia, resilient, Native history is Kentucky's history and its longest chapter. These are the periods of Kentucky history that archaeologists and historians have outlined. These are the different names of these and the time periods of these prior to the arrival of Europeans. And here are the names and time periods of the Native history after Europeans have arrived. Okay, you guys ready? Okay, hang on. All right. The very first hunter-gatherer people arrived sometime 9,500 BC or BCE, or, or maybe even earlier. These were hunting and gathering peoples. The environment then was like Canada. The animals were the last of the megafauna of the uh, Ice Age, but also smaller animals too. So imagine Kentucky looking like Canada with the plants and the animals of Canada. A classic uh, image of a native family, small group, hunters, butchering a large elk, you can see here in this slide, and uh, the quintessential uh, example of a native, native uh, tool, the Clovis spear point. Their ancestors, the later hunters and gatherers. This is perhaps the longest period of Kentucky's human history. This time period from uh, 8,000 BCE to 1,000 BCE. You can see a, a Lifeways um, image there in the upper left-hand corner. These folks used the atlatl or spear thrower and spear. The bow and arrow won't show up for thousands and thousands of years. You can see example of spear points at the bottom. The seasonal movement of these hunting and gathering peoples was not random. They weren't running around like chickens with their heads cut off going, gee, where should we find food now? They knew exactly where everything is. Think of yourself going into a grocery store. Well, if you've got time to go to the grocery store, 
and thoughtfully look for food because sometimes you do go into a grocery store like a chicken with your head cut off trying to find something before it's time to get home and make dinner. You know that grocery store. You know where the fruits and vegetables are and the canned vegetables are and the frozen stuff and the sodas and the snacks. You're not walking aimlessly. You know exactly what's in that grocery store. So did these native peoples. And as they moved from place to place in this slide here, do we have a pointer here? Do I have a little pointer? Is that what that red spot is? I'm afraid to push it. Okay, don't, don't push it. All right, I won't push it. You can see how people would move from rock shelter to seasonal camp, berry gathering, seasonal camp, riverside camp, small camps, large camps, rock shelters, moving across the landscape. This wasn't random, and they knew their land like the back of their hand. These are the kinds of animals that these later hunter-gatherers hunted and the plants that they gathered because Kentucky's now climate and environment and weather was more like it is today. These animals continued to be throughout time the animals that they depended on for food and the plants as well. Please notice that I have plant fiber cordage on this slide. Native peoples made fabric from plant fibers. It wasn't all just um, animal skins. I mean, I think native peoples would have disappeared by melting into little puddles of person if they were all wearing animal skins on a very humid Kentucky August day. The hunter-gatherer gardeners from 1000 BCE to 1000 CE, two different images here, their daily life and their ritual life. I don't mean to have you think that there was no ritual life prior to this, but the very overt ritual lives are, are marked on Kentucky's landscape by their burial mounds and their geometric earthworks and sacred circles. Native peoples in Kentucky domesticated local plants Kentucky is one of the six world hearths of plant domestication. This is very important for you to remember. So this is another thing I want you to take home with you tonight. The other stars or the other places in the world, Kentucky, the red star, is right there. Everyone who studies the domestication of plants by humans across the world knows Kentucky because we are a world hearth of plant domestication. Using fire, to clear the land and wooden digging stick and their deep knowledge of plants and their growing ways and their harvesting ways. These are the plants, examples of the plants that these native peoples domesticated and grew. Starchy seeded plants like goosefoot and maygrass, oily seeded plants like sunflower and marsh elder and native squash. They continued to use the atlatl and spear up until about 700 CE. That's when the bow and arrow appears in Kentucky. This, this time period is also uh, distinguished or known especially for the beginnings of uh, earthenware containers. I don't want you to think there weren't other containers beforehand. It's just that earthenware containers appear now on native sites. And here are two examples of some um, geometric earthworks and burial mound. Then the farming peoples from 1000 CE to about 1539 CE. This is before the Europeans arrive. Two different farming kinds of different farming groups. Archaeologists refer to them as Mississippians and Fort Ancient. We're not exactly sure what they called themselves back then. You can see the purple, the purple um, oval that shows where Fort Ancient and Mid Middle Mississippian occur, western and southern for Mississippian, eastern and central for Fort Ancient. Both built mounds, one for the Mississippians, platform mounds where their chiefs resided. The other, low burial mounds. The Mississippian groups lived in town and mound centers. This particular image here is an artist's reconstruction of what 
uh, Jonathan Creek Village in Marshall County might have looked like. And here we have a village, a circular village, uh, at the Fox Farm site in Mason County, what it might have looked like at this time period. Again, these people using fire to clear the land, to pursue a kind of slash and burn or Swidden horticultural uh, farming approach, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, deeply integrated, sustainable agriculture because of the interconnectedness of corn and beans and squash. Some of the tools that they used, the digging stick, but also mussel shells for hose, elk shoulder blades for hose, and stone hose. The Mississippian peoples used the stone hose. The Fort Ancient people used the elk, scapula, and mussel shell hose. Here are the plants they grew, some of the same ones their ancestors had grown, which were native plants, and then others that were not native plants, corn, and beans. Tobacco, too. Around 1400 CE, the Mississippian peoples abandoned their town and mound centers. We're not exactly sure why. Three suggested reasons for why they did. On the eve of written history, at the very beginning of Europeans arriving in, the, in the North America, 1539 to 1730, the Cabern Welburn Mississippians and the Fort Ancient peoples. Gone are the mounds for the Cabern Welburn people, and gone are the mounds in the, for the Fort Ancient people, too. They still live in villages, following the hunting and farming and gathering ways of their ancestors. Here are some examples of tools of daily life, pottery, stone tools, ornaments. And this makes it different, these objects of European manufacture. Now you may say to me, well, Gwen, we know that native peoples used copper during the hunting and gathering and gardening time. How do you know that this is European? Because this stuff is brass. Native peoples had copper, yes but not brass. Neither did they have um, these uh, glass trade beads. These kinds of objects came up through the trading relationships that had de have developed over millennia between groups of people. So, didn't even have to have a European arrive in Kentucky at this time for these kinds of objects to appear in the trading routes. And then we think sometime around the late 1600s comes the first smallpox pandemic. 75 to 95% of Native peoples died. We have experienced now a virgin soil pandemic ourselves. 2020 and the arrival of the coronavirus. No natural immunity. We have ways to deal with it now. They did not and the impact to the native cultures was staggering. The older people and the younger people were hardest hit, their past and their future. I'm only going into just a little bit of the decades in this time period when the hunter-gatherer farmers are intersecting the two worlds as Europeans arrive in person in the Ohio Valley. The Lower Shawnee Town in 1758, at the mouth of the former, the former mouth of the Scioto River, mainly in Ohio, but also in Kentucky. This, uh, this, this village is described in trader and explorers journals. It's on period maps. We know the names of some of their leaders. We know how many people live there. We know where the council house was. Then we have an image of, a of the 1796 Shawnee guy in Illinois. The same kind of trade goods appear at this time, but other things too. Rum, guns, pots. And there's a map of the British and French possessions in, in America. Native peoples are appearing in written documents now. Their history is being written in these documents, but still being written on the land. 
now, and will speak about, <clears throat> let's see, where's my note here? Now I pass this on to Ann Bader of Corn Island Archaeology, who will talk about objects linked to Native people's stories. Thank you, Gwen. You got it covered. Mm -hmm. okay. You're the next one. Do it. There we go. So I, in concert with the archaeologists who work with me at Corn Island, acknowledge and recognize the Native American peoples on whose ancestral lands we conduct our research. And so I want to talk to you today a little bit more in depth about some of the artifacts and some of those that we find right here in this area with the intent to support what Gwen has told us, what LaDonna has told us, that people lived here indeed for thousands and thousands of years, that this was not just a hunting ground that people escorted themselves into and stayed for a very brief time and then left. The artifacts I want to talk to you about today are those that are associated with residents, with, with living in houses and, and permanent or semi-permanent uh, villages and camps. Excuse me. So most people in the general public, when they think of Native American artifacts, the first thing they're going to be thinking of are arrowheads. Arrowheads, which is a broad term that encompasses also spear points and dart points. And you know, collectively, we like to call them projectile points because they're all projected through, through the space. But these are the ones that most people are familiar with in the general public. I want to talk to you about some tonight that may be a little less well known to the people and um, that, are, again, I say are associated with uh, residents. In particular, I want to talk about three different groups, groundstone tools, bone tools and ceramics. And um, the ground stone tools are kind of interesting here in that they are often made of materials that are not local to Kentucky. They're not made of our sedimentary limestone. Mainly they're made from like metamorphic or igneous rocks that come rolling down the river uh, with, with the flow of the water. And so they are harder rock. They are more, uh, more granitic-like. And so they're very suitable for the types of tasks that you would use for ground stone. The bone tools very often came from the long bones of animals, but also other portions of the animal as well. And ceramics are made of fired clay and earth. So ground stone is one of the, and I'm not going to go through all the different kinds of ground stone. There's just no way we can cover everything in 15 minutes. Uh, but the ground stone tools are very often very, very large, very heavy, very bulky. They um, are used to process, excuse me, to process plants nuts, for instance, um, and they're not anything that's really suitable for a mobile group. A big, large uh, ground stone tool is not something you're going to take on a hunting trip. Um, and so also you will find, and I'm going to show you some examples of these in a minute, but uh, also you will find that these things are stored at a site very often for future use. They might dig a hole in the ground and put these big, large ground stone tools in there, and they would come back and use them again over and over. Because as Gwen said, these people had thousands of years of knowledge of that land. They had a deep connection with the land. They knew exactly how to get back to where they found the best nuts the year before and to process those. They could find those again. Uh, they had their landmarks on the landscape and it was something that uh, they were very, very familiar with. And so they might dig a large hole, put these ground stone objects in it, cover it back up with dirt, maybe put a layer of rock on it, maybe a wooden pole, and then when they came back the next year, they knew exactly where to find it. And because these artifacts are so large and so bulky, um, and, and that they stayed with the site very often, they're often referred to as site furniture. They belong to that site. So this would include things like mortars and pestles. Um, so um, where seeds would be ground, other materials might also be ground by the pestle and the mortar beneath it. 
things like nutting stones, often called cup stones, although I've been hearing lately about some other types of uses for that uh, type of artifact. But those are very large, very heavy, very, very much something that you're not going to want to carry around. And then other types of pitted stones and, and large rock that you could be using for grinding, uh, for instance, are rolling grain. These in particular are both found in this area. This one at the bottom is at the, um, um, excuse me, <laughs> at the Falls of the Ohio State Park right now. That is over two and a half feet long. That is a large, massive artifact. And there is a second one at the Clark County Museum, uh, which is just as long. And it is, I mean, it's, it's big. So, you know, grinding and processing materials. An example of a storage pit where um, this one was on Shipping Port Island. So you can see where they had dug the hole. Things were in there. It had been covered up. People could come back. And often we'll find like five, six, seven pestles in a pit around here. You know, a lot of times, in some cases, there were like communal cooking areas. Other times there might have been, you know, one associated with each house. But if you had a communal cooking area, you had five or six pestles, you may have five or six families whose tools were all in that same place and using those artifacts year after year. Um, this is a little spindle whirl. Uh, again, this was found on Shipping Port Island. This is not one of the types of things that you're going to take on a hunting trip. These are things that are associated with day-to-day -day living. These are things that women would have used to make clothing. I want to talk about these bone artifacts for a while. Uh, bone artifacts are mostly associated, well, I don't want to say mostly, uh, a group of, of bone artifacts are associated with sewing, weaving, and leatherworking. Uh, you can see that these that are shown here are not going to be needles. The head of these are too, too large. They would not have been able to um, uh, pass through a hole and leave you with a secure um, seam there. Those are mostly likely used for basketry or weaving or making some sort of nets of something of that sort. Um, and so then there are awls, which are pointed uh, bone, which would have been used for leather working to, per, uh, to perforate holes in the leather. Um, and also there are a group of artifacts here that are very high, highly decorated and with beautiful designs on them that we also see not only in southern Indiana but in southern Illinois. And there are some thoughts that these might represent either specific families or specific clans and that the commonality of those designs in Louisville and other areas around and southern Illinois might reflect the exchange of women through marriage exchange, marriage partners. And so um, those I will show you here in a minute. Along with some of these other artifacts, that are made out of uh, bone that may have been used for personal adornment. So let me show you. The ones on the left most likely were needles. The tops of them are broken where the eye was. But these are thinner. They're highly polished. They would have slid through very well to the fabric. The ones on the right, again, are very, very much uh, coarser. And as you can see on the second one um, from the right, <laughs> there's like a head on that one. And that would, not, that would have, that would have been a, an obstacle trying to pull that through any kind of material. So that one was probably used again for basketry or weaving. Um, these are the bone awls, very sharpened pieces of bone. You will see them polished. Often the polish is from use, from the oils in your skin, but oftentimes they were deliberately polished just to smooth them. And also, that polish had a tendency to protect them against the elements and, and keep the water off of them uh, so that they would last longer. But these, excuse me, pointed awls were very useful in perforating leather and other hard elements. We have a number, and these were also found here, uh, the ones in the lower bottom, at the bottom, uh, were found here in the county. These are tattoo pens. And I love that, that fact that we had this beautiful image of this woman uh, with her tattoos because this was something that dates, uh, there's an ancient history of tattooing in this part of the country. These particular pins are 5,000 years old. And so we know that these are something um, that uh, uh, it has a long and ancient history to it. The ones on the top and the right, these are from a recent study in Tennessee. Those use the turkey metatarsal, where the ones at the bottom were a smaller uh, bird bone, which are more hollow, and uh, also very, very suitable, very sharpened edge, but they had that naturally hollow um, uh, cavity in there that would have held the ink. 
These are the decorated pens that I was telling you about. And you can notice that, and I have a better picture here in a minute. These are, some of these are local, some of these are from between here and Evansville uh, along the Ohio River, but they've got, um, some of them are broken, of course, but you see the ones that are perforated. Those uh, are probably, could have been used as pendants, but uh, they might have also just been used uh, to attach to the clothing and used as clothing pins, a lot like our safety pins. Some people say that they may have been used for hair ornamentation as well, but they are found uh, in, in all kinds of situations. And um, so, so the interesting, the designs on these are very, very uh, repetitive in this area and down to, um, like I said, Southern Illinois. These were found at the airport, our Louisville airport, and they are 5,000 years old. So the art is beautiful. The, the designs, again, are very complex, and if these were indeed associated with particular families, then we have a, a connection between here and, and downriver to the south and all the way to Illinois. Um, some of these are pendants. The one in the middle is a bone bead. We have two other beads on this side uh, as well, and so these are all ornamentation that um, was used for necklaces. And I've also lately been very much interested in the painted bone. Um, the one at the top came from down near West Point on the Salt River. And that one is a very interesting artifact, so very highly polished. And it's also one that is, this is the top left, is one that uh, has got a very, uh, we don't know what it was for. But it's obviously meant to have been seen. So it could have been an ear spool, or it also might have been a lip ornament, but it's something that is so polished and so smooth, but it's also something that was highly visible, and it has been painted with red stripes or dark stripes. This pin on the right side came from Clarksville, and that has got the most fine decorative incising that I've seen on many a bone pin. It also had remnants of a red paint. So in this area, you can see in the bottom left, all of these different pigments that come from iron, from the knobs around Louisville, and these things, there's a variety of colors of yellow and orange and deep reds, and those things were used, they're readily available, used to make different color uh, of, of, in their art. And then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, ceramics, and uh, I'm not the ceramic expert, Miss Gwen is, but this one was found near Carrollton. This is about a foot tall, and, but it is a very, very, very thin uh, pot, and it's beautiful. And um, I remember when we were excavating this, so concerned, so concerned that we weren't gonna get this thing out in one piece that we went to the local dollar store and bought a bunch of pampers and came home and wrapped them up in diapers. <laughs> but at any rate, um, these pottery generally associated with food storage and preparation and with cooking and uh, Things that, you know, again, ceramics can be very big. Some of them can be very large. They can be very, very heavy. Some of them are smaller. But in any case, they are not something that you would normally take on a hunting party. I mean, people are going to eat out when they're hunting. They may be cooking um, meat that they had, but they may have been bringing dried plant foods and dried meat along with them when they're camping. So it's something that not only are they large and bulky like the groundstone, but they're fragile. Uh, even the ones that are earlier, which are thicker, they are also still very fragile. And um, so I'll show you a few of those examples locally, along with some of the water bottles. Uh, well, a water bottle. And then I want to talk to you about this anomaly, and we've got a few of these upstairs, if anybody wants to see them, the clay cooking balls, and I'll show you those. So these were all found locally, and these are in one piece generally which is not something that is all that common to find, but these are plain uh, utilitarian, except for the top right, which has a little bit more of an, of, of a, an aesthetic look to it. Um, and then we have others, and again, we'll go back to Shipping Port, where we find some highly decorative artifacts and pottery, and these pottery are such that indicate that they had a connection during the Mississippian period with the Fort Ancient people to the east, and that they were bringing in other designs, other colors, uh, I don't mean colors, but other um, uh, just elements of, of ornamentation that we did not have here in the Mississippian period, and also different vessel forms. 
Um, this one is from Shipping Port again. This is a very unique artifact. This is negative uh, painted. There are more examples of this at the Falls of the Ohio. This one shows a connection between the Louisville area and Evansville at the Angel Mound site. So you can read in these artifacts a lot of, of interconnectedness among the native peoples throughout the region. Okay, the artifacts on the left, that is the front and back of a water bottle. It's an effigy water bottle. It's a bear. That is not from here. But on the right, this one is from Clark County and the Prather site. And this one looks to me to be like an owl or maybe, uh, I don't think a hawk, but like an owl. So, you know, we only had fragments of it. But so we do have that beautiful art that is happening here in, in this area as well. And then these are the clay cooking balls. Um, these things are about the size of, a, a, if you were to grab a clump of clay, about the size of your hand. They have, although there's not very many shown here, there are a number of different designs. A lot of people will say, or have thought, that these took the place of rock and when you're doing hot uh, rock cooking. And so you would take water and you'd get these things heated and drop them in the water and that would bring the, the temperature up and you could cook. Uh, and that, that a lot of people would say that hey, these were used in place of rock in places where they didn't have rock. But we know that's not the case, that there is firecracked rock, uh, even on sites that have these. These were found in the millions at Poverty Point in northern Louisiana. And between here and there, uh, Clarksville is about the site where we find them the most. But there are uh, uh, examples all along the Mississippi River, but in lesser numbers. So those are kind of an enigma. We are thinking now that, again, the different shapes, some of them look like pumpkins, um, some of them have um, um, stripes. We're now thinking that some of these might also recognize tribal affiliations or clans or families. So again, uh, something um, that we're trying to understand. So you can see what I'm getting at here. These artifacts are associated not with hunting, not with uh, a very extremely mobile society, but those who were staying at home, like, uh, these were all, a lot of these were artifacts associated with women. These were artifacts that were food preparation uh, and fiber working and plant working and tending the crops that were nearby. You know, and I'm not going to say that women never hunted. There is a University of Louisville professor right now studying a hunting toolkit that was buried with a woman. But in a general perspective, women are tied to home by means of their child-bearing and child-rearing responsibilities. And so these are things that are associated with the homemakers, and they are at home, and the, the food collectors. And so you will see that, you know, um, they're very thousands of years old, and they're throughout the state. Um, and so, um, 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 I've lost my train of thought. So finding these domestic artifacts throughout the state is a good, again, a good indicator that we do have a lot of evidence, hard concrete evidence, that people lived here and lived here uh, permanently since 10,000 years. And with that, we will turn that over again to LaDonna. So I get to tell you guys the rest of the story. What happened to these people, to the ancient people that lived here and left artifacts behind for you all to find when you're out in your gardens or you're plowing up your fields? So um, to give you the rest of the story, um, we, the Chickasaw people, refer to our forced removal out of our homelands as the removal. Um, we know that the Cherokee and the, Ch Cherokee and the Choctaw refer to the removal as the Trelateers. Um, but our ancestors, I never grew up with that terminology. All I ever heard was we were forcefully removed from our homeland. And so I didn't know what a Trelateers was. It, I was clueless about that, but definitely the Cherokees and the Choctaws will let you know that that's, that's what they refer to that, that time. So uh, to give you an idea 
of what happened after we left our homeland. So many events facilitated decisions to bring the act of Indian removal in the Southeast into reality. And um, there's a lot of information I've got to get through, so I'm going to be reading some of it and then just talking about some of it. Um, the main reason for Indian removal is that more Europeans had poured into this country and they began quickly overpopulating their cities and their towns that they had created. And so this circumstance occurred, they began looking westward on this continent for more land. The law that authorized this decision occurred in 1830 when Andrew Jackson, president of the US, was successful in passing legislation known as the Indian Removal Act. Basically, this legislation stated that the first Americans located in the Southeast would be removed to an, to an area set aside for them west of the Mississippi River and that they would give up their lands east of the Mississippi River. The legislation directly affected the Chickasaw people since our homeland territory included the present day states of southwestern Kentucky, western Tennessee, northern Alabama, and northern Mississippi. In 1832, the treaty with the U.S. and the Chickasaw, also known as the Treaty of Pontotoc Creek, was ratified and set forth guidelines for the forced Chickasaw removal. Chickasaw leaders were very much opposed to being removed from our homeland and they traveled to Indian territory searching for suitable land but never were able to find any with, through their exploration. When the leaders returned to our homeland, they reported to President Jackson their disappointment in the search for a new homeland. As you can imagine, land in Oklahoma just does not look like our land in our homeland of Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Alabama. It was just not comparable. Um, in Oklahoma, where we were located, relocated to, is that um, there's a lot of prairies. Um, it's very rocky. Um, can't grow anything there, because uh, if you try to plow down, you'll just hit rocks, or clay, a lot of clay. Um, Plants can't live in clay. Um, so we were very disappointed, and we told this president that we did not want to go to Indian Territory. But it was of no use because President Jackson said his hands were tied. He said that if the residents of the state of Mississippi were to burn down our ancestors' homes, burn their crops in the field, and steal livestock, there was nothing he could do. And if the Chickasaws retaliated, he would have to declare war on the Chickasaw people. The Chickasaws had already fought many wars. We had protected and preserved our boundaries. We had fought against all of the different tribes around us. We fought with the Choctaws. We fought with the Creeks. We fought with the Cherokees. We fought with the Shawnee, trying to defend our homeland boundaries. This was just way too much for us to do. We even fought against uh, Europeans' uh, superpower, the French. We were able to defeat the French on our homeland. And so he said that he would declare war against the Chickasaws, but he, because he did not consider Chickasaw people to be American citizens. So we were forced to remove, to remove, to remove from our homeland. Because of strategic delays and reluctance to leave, our ancestors departed from our historic homeland on July 4th, 1837. Our ancestors started gathering in Memphis in, on May 1st of 1837. They could have left any time between May and June but they waited. And I think it's a ploy by our ancestors that if the Americans are gonna write down everything about their history, then they're gonna write this about their history, that we're leaving 
on their day of independence. So while the people of Memphis are celebrating their Independence Day, our ancestors are leaving our homeland, leaving the land that they, we believe that God gave us and setting forth to another land that we didn't know anything about it. And there was other people living there. So our ancestors were ferried across the Mississippi River and offloaded on the eastern bank of Arkansas and initiated a long, miserable journey to Indian Territory. They took almost everything that they could carry with them. We had heard about the stories of the other tribes that went to Indian Territory. We heard about the Choctaws who got there in the wintertime and that they, the federal government told the Choctaws that they would supply them with everything and they got there and they had nothing. They didn't have anything, any tools to build houses with. They had no, no tools to create gardens with. They had no weaponry to you know, hunt and kill animals. They didn't even have their livestock. They came to Indian Territory with nothing and nothing was provided for them. They almost all perished during that first winter. According to historian Daniel Littlefield, quote, Chickasaws exerted control over their forced removal process. Their willingness to strike out for their Western nation on their own and to abandon initial plans and follow their judgment, unquote. End quote. Instead of settling for the 30 pound limit for baggage set by the government, instead of walking like the other tribes did, the Chickasaws took what they wanted with them, many riding in their own carriages and wagons, others riding steamboats, and the remainder riding horseback, unquote. And to give you an idea about taking our livestock with us, a lady in my church is, she's about 95 years old, she said she never learned anything about the removal or the Trail of Tears. But she said the story that has handed down from her is that her grandfather arrived at Memphis with 2,000 head of horses. And they said, this is not the, the, um, the livestock uh, crossing area. You're going to have to go south down through Louisiana down that way to Fort Towson. Um, and so she said that was her grandfather. And can you imagine? That was her grandfather. He was the one that told her that he came to Memphis with the 2,000 heads of horses. By the time we get to people like me, it's only like three or four generations that separated from the removal. It was my great-great-grandfather who came over on the removal. Um, he said they left in November on a cold, drizzly day, much like today's weather. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he was about five years old, and when they got to Memphis, they put him on a ferry, they ferried him across the river, and he said they got off the ferry, and then they started walking to Indian Territory. He didn't know what Indian Territory was. And he said when people started walking, he said it was the quietest he had ever heard his family. He said you could hear people sniffling, maybe people coughing, clearing their throats. He said that's all you could hear. He said no one, you didn't hear sounds of happiness. So when we talk about the removal, the removal is not that far removed from us. And it's very hard for our people to talk about removal because there's so many traumatic things that happened. Um, some of our people um, have uh, ancestors who were orphans on the removal. They walked with families, families just took them in. So when they tried to look back um, for their genealogy, the, far, the farthest they can get back is to that one person who was, in, who was the uh, uh, orphan on the, um, on the removal. <clears throat> so in 
So as our ancestors arrived in Indian Territory, they had signed a treaty which provided for settlement into the Western District of the Choctaw Territory. Settling into the Western District of Choctaw Terri Territory was made possible through the treaty with the U.S., the Choctaw, and Chickasaw of 1837. We took part in this Choctaw government for several years, but a problem that we had was we felt the dwindling away of our Chickasaw cultural identity. Because in Mississippi, in our homeland, we were a great and mighty nation. And then we came to Indian Territory and we was just lumped in with the Choctaws. And then we were expected to be, uh, set up our own sort of government within the Choctaws. It just didn't work. And Chickasaw, pe Chickasaw people and Choctaw people began to feel animosity toward each other. So we took part in the Choctaw government for several years, but felt the dwindling away of our cultural identity. So our leaders requested permission to operate personal business and political affairs on our own. We were granted this opportunity through a treaty with the US, Choctaw, and Chickasaw in 1855. And in 1856, our leaders composed a constitution which provided the opportunity to vote for a leader. And we refer to this leader as a governor. The first governor was Cyrus Harris. He was forcibly removed from his home in the Pontotoc, Mississippi area. We were able to establish ourselves in Indian territory by building homes, planting gardens, and large agricultural fields, creating large herds of livestock, building businesses, and operating our own governmental structure. We were successful in these endeavors and until the beginning of the Civil War. Oh, there's a slide missing. Hmm. So this is about civil war in Indian territory. Um, so once again, with the civil war, we were faced with um, harsh living conditions and political upheaval, even within our own government. The Chickasaw Nation tried to remain neutral during the war. However, since the war is taking place in our territory and around us, we had to become involved. After the Civil War ended, the US federal government thought that tribes who participated in the war should be punished. Once again, they took land to create railroads that would reach intercontinentally. And so when they took the lands, they took it um, uh, a north and south right of way and an east and west right of way through um, the lands of the tribes who were removed from their homelands. Oh, hmm, another slide is missing. Okay, um, so in 1892, 1890, is pretty significant for um, our people. Uh, the region known as Indian Territory became known as Oklahoma, Oklahoma Territory, and was moving toward recognition as a state. This meant that lands meant for Native people had to be divided and allotted to the heads of households for those families who had been forced from their homelands. This resulted in legislation known as the Dawes Act or the General Allotment Act which was passed in 1887 during the administra administration of President Grover Cleveland. This legislation allowed the federal government to break up tribal lands and aim to assimilate first Americans into mainstream U.S. society by encouraging them towards farming and agriculture, which meant dividing tribal lands into individual plots. Which brings us to the reason that um, the five tribes in Oklahoma have to have census cards. So the Dawes Act also provided a role of all the citizens within a tribe because as you know, as I just said, um, every heads of household had to be allotted land. And so um, this 
allotment list provided a role of all the citizens within the tribe. Um, so this particular role determines who is a member of a particular tribe with which a person may be affiliated. So if you're put on the Dawes Roll as Chickasaw and then you list your household as Chickasaw, it's, it's, it's our own Chickasaw census. Um, today, the Dawes Roll is the determining factor of a person being placed on tribal roles and recognized as a citizen. So in order to be recognized as a uh, Chickasaw citizen, tribal citizen, your name, somebody in your family had to have a census card and that you have to prove your relationship to that person on this census card. And of course we had to redact some of the information on there because uh, people come up, we do see, um, forged census cards, we see forged tribal ID cards, we see forged certificate degree of Indian blood cards. Um, you, it's, it's amazing uh, what people will do nowadays. In 1907, Oklahoma attained statehood and the state and federal government began to strip away tribal identity through legislation in addition to placing severe restrictions upon tribal governments. So one important structure became very, very significant for the Southeastern Indians, and that was the churches. The cultural features that display identities such as language, songs, dances, games, spirituality, etc., were outlawed were outlawed. Consequently, to a large degree, these cultural features went underground. The place where cultural identity was principally practiced was in native churches. One place that the makers of the laws may have felt that native people were assimilating were in the churches. Little did they know, the culture continued to fiercely survive. The churches took the place of where we taught our culture. It was also a place to discuss tribal issues that affected the tribes who had been removed from their homeland. So in the churches, we were able to sing our own native hymns. Today, we sing our own native hymns. Um, today, the preaching takes place in our native language. Um, we get together um, and have feasts at our churches. Um, the churches also are set up in the way that our, um, our uh, ceremonial grounds are set up, um, but it's only on the inside of the church. So in some of our churches, some of the, the older churches, um, what you'll see is that when you walk in, the, the door will face the east. Our, the doors of our structures have always faced the east. So the doors of these churches will face the east. And when you walk in, you will see pews um, that face the front, but you will also have pews that face toward the altar, and then you will have the main leaders that sit along the back row. And this follows our ceremonial ground layout. So the churches quickly took on that um, cultural layout. Um, and it's one place where we could practice our culture without, without it being um, judged. So the leader of this time, his name was Douglas, Governor Douglas Johnston. Um, and when Oklahoma became a state, the the state government and federal government quickly stripped away all our tribal governmental duties. And so they put a person in place, um, Governor Douglas Johnston. Governor Johnston was a very, very important leader during this time. 
One thing that Governor Johnston felt like was the most important thing for Chickasaw students and youth was to be educated. And he felt like the best way to get an education was to bring in the missionaries. Now, at first, our ancestors totally rejected the idea of bringing the missionaries in. And the reason is, we had our own spirituality. We had our own understanding of, of our own religion. We didn't need that foreign religion. So we totally rejected that, but we knew that we wanted our children to be educated. And the reason that they knew that we needed our children to be educated is because our children were living in a brand new type of world. We were already locked into a modern world economy that stretched across the ocean. So our children were learning brand new things and they needed to be successful and competitive in this brand new world. And so Douglas Johnston wanted um, the kids, the students, to be um, very highly educated. Douglas Johnston spent his life, spent his life working tirelessly for the Chickasaw people. He died in office in 1939, and in 1939, a new, a new leader was appointed by the president. Uh, so the new leader was Floyd Maytubby, and he served from 1939 to 1963. Um, a grassroots movement began during the 1950s and early 1960s, resulting in getting a new leader appointed by the name of Governor of Overton James. In 1970, uh, in 1970, through legislation enacted by Congress, our people were able to hold tribal elections, allowing us to elect our own leaders, and our modern-day government began. The elected governor of the Chickasaw Nation was Overton James. And as you can see, this is, an, this is our annual meeting, um, and it was held outside in an arbor. Governor James began to establish programs for our people in the areas of health, education, jobs, and housing. Throughout his administration, he worked diligently to create a better life for Chickasaw people. So you will see um, the top right-hand picture is the Carl Lauber Indian Health Facility. Um, he helped to get that uh, facility built in Ada. Um, you'll see... Uh, the um, child care, um, early child care development center. Um, and then here's one of our houses. That's what we refer to as a uh, modern day Chickasaw house. And then people um, creating jobs for people at the Chickasaw Nation. So a new governor was elected in 1987. That, this gentleman's name was Governor Bill Anatomy. Governor Bill Anatomy is currently the governor of the Chickasaw people. Um, while making sure the programs were being maintained in addition to attending to essential tribal issues, Governor Anatomy also established the precursor to the casinos, the bingo parlor. Once the bingo businesses began to flourish, much needed funding for our programs and services was, was provided in a huge way. Um, and that's the, the uh, department, I, I'm, for, I'm out of uh, the Culture and Humanities Department. We have over 300 um, employees in our department alone. The Chickasaw Nation hires approximately 13,000 employees in the state of Oklahoma. Um, so it just goes to show that once the casinos got started, um, it really began to fund um, jobs and training and education opportunities for our people. But not a, now, not only the, for our people, because there's only like 60,000 people, um, tribal members, 
but this is also um, for, uh, uh, fortunate for the state of Oklahoma. Today, Governor Anatomy's focus of health, education, jobs, and housing are established and maintained. Yet several other items have been added, which are the preservation of our culture, business prospects, program, programs and services to help our communities, and other programs which benefit our people. This standard to provide for our people is set by the, our mission statement created for our citizens, which is to enhance the overall quality of life of the Chickasaw people. On October 1st, 2020, our citizens met at Tishomingo, Oklahoma for our annual meeting and festival. Governor Anatubby gave an uplifting and inspiring address to the Chickasaw citizens in attendance and over the internet, stating, quote, I am pleased to report that the state of the Chickasaw Nation is strong, that we continue to prosper, and that we remain vigilant in the protection of our lands, our culture, and our sovereignty, unquote. Yoko K, okay. thank you. This is the result of the ancestors of the Chickasaw people that first referred to a part of the state of Kentucky as our homeland. We are still here and have a strong nation with a thriving culture. I invite you to visit the Chickasaw Nation located in South Central Oklahoma and learn the rest of the major and fascinating details to our history. Thank you for letting me present our Chickasaw history regarding our homeland in Kentucky. Thank you, LaDonna. Thank you, Ann, and thank you, Gwen. And Fred, I'm going to bring you up. He's going to, as we close out tonight, just tell you for a couple minutes a little bit about his story and then introduce a song as we close the evening out. Good evening. Can everybody say Yatehe? Uh, that's hello in my language. Yatehe Kwasu Nishe Eya, Fred Kings and Jeh. Le Tsao Dana Shawan Auto Shea Nanisht Eje, Do Kachini, Do Hanagahi, and Shle. I am born for the Red Bottom Water Clan and the one who walks around and learning. Uh, well, thank you for that. Or for having me here, I'm I'm very honored. You know, thank you very much. And learning about the Chickasaw, I don't know anything about the Chickasaw Nation, and but there's a lot of similarities that we have in common, like the uh, the census number. Uh, that was the first thing uh, I was taught before my Social Security. Uh, my census number is six six fourteen four seventeen. That's that's my number, and. Uh, we have the, uh, they like to have the long walk. I mean, they have like the uh, um, Trail of Tears. We have the, we have the long walk. And, uh, but uh, I, I'm very honored to be here. And uh, this song I'm going to play um, is a love song. Uh, this native flute here is actually a Comanche flute that was given to me. And it's actually, in, uh, it's called a grandfather tuning. And uh, it has no, uh, it's not tuned to any pentatonic scale. It's actually made from the maker's ear. So I, I really enjoy playing these kind of flutes because you can make your own song as you go. And, and a lot of the uh, uh, songs were passed down uh, generation to generation. And a lot of our elders are taking their, their songs and their stories and leaving us with uh, the flute. So as we go along, we learn our own songs. So, so this song I'm going to play is a love song. Um, a long time ago, the flute was made for a, a courtship. So when uh, a gentleman uh, admired a, a lady and he wouldn't, uh, couldn't do anything to get her attention, so he would play a song for her with the flute. So that's how the f flute was. So he would serenade her heart. So this song I'm going to play is a love song. And I hope you enjoy it. And again, thank you for having me here. Ishahat. So if you say Ishahat, that's thank you in my language. So. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, Fred. Fred, quickly, if you don't mind telling people if they want, I know you, you actually make many of these flutes. If people want to learn more about you and your music, is there a website or something they can go to? Uh, the only... The only uh, way you can catch me is on Facebook. I did have a website, but it didn't really do me anything. So, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can just type in my name, Fred Keems, on Facebook, and uh, you'll see all the pictures and uh, uh, um, the poor performances I do. And I do make my flutes, and I do sell them all over the world. And I just have uh, <clears throat> uh, I do I use Kentucky cedar uh, out of uh, Harrisburg, and. Uh, as far as music, uh, I, I really don't, uh, I don't, I just have one CD I made 10 years ago and I have not made another one, so. <laughs> then it was a real treat for us to be able to hear you today. Yes. Uh, love that, but, love that. We just wanted uh, to make sure much. that, uh, thank you so much. And just so you know, his uh, last name is spelled K-E-A-M-S in case anyone is wanting to look him up on Facebook. Uh, a round of applause please for all of our presenters tonight. Thank you all so much. And for Fred, and for our teachers who came out to learn more, to, to, to teach this important history, as, as you said, Native history is Kentucky history. I think we all learned that tonight. Did everybody feel like they learned something tonight? Well, I thank you all, I really do, for coming out tonight and these temperatures and the traffic and everything to learn more. And I really do appreciate it. And thank you all so much for coming. And as we leave, Fred, do you mind just playing another, another tune for folks? And thank you all. Safe travels home. Our experts will be here if you have any questions you wanted to come up and ask them. I was going to be respectful of your time and not take questions, but they'll be here for a couple minutes if anybody wanted to come up and talk with them. Thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.